Um, so let's start off with some hard ones. Uh, we're going to need to read. <laughs> I was like, hard ones? Okay. Hard gotcha. ones, yeah. <laughs> let's start with your name, pronouns, and Indigenous Nation. Oh, before I say that, um, my, well, anyway, maybe I'll answer and it'll get us into a conversation. Um, so, um, bonjour, I'm Colette Pichon Battle. I use she, her pronouns. Um, my family ties are to the Choctaw Nation on the North Shore. My identity is African-American and I'm from St. Tammany Parish. Um, where do you reside now? I live about a mile from where I grew up um, in Slidell, Louisiana. Um, my uh, Heritage is in this area called Bayou Vincent. So it's between Bayou Bonfouca, uh, Bayou Vincent, and Bayou Liberty. And it's a particular Creole enclave. And I live about a mile from that right now since Katrina um, took out our um, family home. We haven't been able to return there. Uh, so I rent a house about a mile from my grandfather's house. That's what I call my grandfather's house, but it's our land. Um, in Slidell, which is actually in between Slidell and Lacombe. Yeah. Um, so get a better sense of who you are and kind of like the overarching that we're probably gonna circle around a lot going back to. Um, do you wanna give a quick life story, say in three minutes, but you know, just give us the big arc to where you came from and where you are now. Love it. The three minute life story. Um, love that challenge. Well, I um, come from Jim Battle, who is Black and Cato in North Louisiana. Uh, I was born in Shreveport um, to the Battle tribe. <laughs> That's not really a tribe. That's just what I call that crew. Um, and um, I, my mother is from Southeast Louisiana. So she is Creole from St. Tammany Parish. Um, and I started my journey in life um, in Shreveport. Then we moved to Morgan City. My dad worked in oil and gas. And then um, when my grandmother got sick, um, my mother who's the oldest girl in a family of 13, um, uh, we moved back to Slidell to live um, very close to my grandmother. And it was my mom's job to take care of my grandmother who um, was paralyzed by her stroke. And so spent, I guess, since I was about eight in Slidell and then grew up there, went to Slidell High, um, graduated and went to college in Ohio, um, studied international relations and world religion and got to uh, after I graduated from college, live in Africa for a couple of years, where I lived in North and West Africa, um, Morocco, Mauritania, and Senegal. Um, came back to the United States, went to law school at Southern in Baton Rouge um, after a conversation with my uncle and my mother under the tree, um, which is where all big decisions get made in my family. Um, so uh, you know, just trying to figure out what law school I wanted to go to in Louisiana. I knew I wanted to go to law school in Louisiana, but it was um, my mother, who was a graduate of Southern, my father, who was a graduate of Southern, who said, you know, it's an important experience for you to have um, some of your education at a historically Black college or university. So I uh, got my law degree from Southern, graduated, um, took the bar in Louisiana, and then moved to Florida, where I started working in um, immigration and working on the rights of uh, refugees, um, specifically trafficked women um, from Eastern Europe, which was very interesting. I went to work on the rights of Haitian refugees, but when I got to Florida, the bigger issue that was happening at that time was trafficked women. So I was coming into immigration right when they were making what's called the T and the U visa. And it's a very exciting time because now those are visas that are used specifically to help people who are, who are being targeted. Um, went to DC, worked in a um, corporate law firm, worked in business immigration law. And um, Katrina hit in 2005, at which time I left DC 
came back home, which was going to be for what I thought was going to be a short time. Um, but I have not left since 2005 um, after getting back home and seeing what happened, um, how things were playing out, um, what happened to my community, what happened to my mom, um, what happened to our land, what happened to our community that had been there for so long. Um, you know, it was mind boggling to see something um, so immediate take out a community that had been there for so long. My community has been where it is since the 1770s. Um, and that's just what they can document. So, um, so yeah, started uh, providing legal services in the aftermath of climate disaster, started understanding a little bit more about organizing and movement building, started to see the injustices in our structures and in our laws, the laws that I you know, took an oath to uphold. Um, and so began to see my role as needing to change these laws and structures that, that you know, really don't allow for people to recover. Um, and then in 2010, BP oil drilling disaster happened. And that's really when I began to make big connections between the disaster of Katrina and the climate impact of fossil fuel extraction and how climate disaster um, really plays out in places like South Louisiana and communities like mine. So um, have now been in this work and am seeing, see myself and am seen by others as a leader in the climate justice movement, a voice coming out from the South, um, coming out from the bayous unapologetically so, um, and a leader specifically in African-American spaces around um, climate justice um, and a bridge builder in many multiracial spaces around alliance building and network building so that we all survive. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking notes here. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> uh, I guess, you know, I guess gonna we're gonna stray off the questions really soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're gonna go Louisiana on them and just get off the questions all together and just start the talking. The map is starting to to fill yes. up. But, um, I, you know, I think this one thing that we were talking about when we were, you know, selecting who to talk to and stuff is that, you know, Ida really was, uh, was adamant, like, this is a great, this would be a great connection to make. Um, and a lot of that came from um, their experience working with you uh, during the Sacred Water Pit pilgrimage. Oh, sure. um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. I'm going to move to my comfortable chair so you might see okay. this, but I'm coming. <laughs> right. Um, I got the email from Ida and I was thinking, are they sure they want to talk to me? I have a um, very interesting cultural background that is usurped often by the political requirements of, of race in the U.S. and identity. Um, and it is really at the, at the, core of what the Sacred Waters Pilgrimage was all about. Um, the truth is, where I grew up in Slidell or in Bayou Vincent, I, I've asked my family a number of times, what, you know, who are the indigenous folks and where are they? And over and over again, what's told to me is that the Creole people and the native people were considered non-Black. And in the days of segregation and nation building, the non-Black folks were put in one spot, the Black folks were put in another spot and the white folks were put in a third spot. And so when it came down to where I grew up in this Bayou Vincent, Bayou Liberty, Bayou Bonfouca area, the indigenous folks and the Creole folks were put together. And there wasn't a real distinction between the two, they shared a culture they shared, um, you know, they shared a geography. Um, my uncles tell me stories about fights that they had. Um, I'm assuming there was girls and in, in liquor involved, but um, I don't, I don't get all those details. I just hear about the, the fights, um, you know, going back and forth to Lacombe and and all and all that. But the but the grouping was one grouping. 
Um, they married each other, they lived together. Um, and I remember growing up and going to spaces where it was, it was just all one, it was just all one community. So fast forward 30 something years in the midst of this climate work, um, nationally watching the tensions between um, indigenous Native American and African American folks play out again and again. And I was personally a part of a very intense struggle and I didn't understand what was happening. And in the, in the middle of the intense personal struggle uh, that I went through with, with a Native woman, um, I was informed that this was an ongoing struggle that I had simply come into. Like this had been going on since the 60s and since the 70s. And I was like, it has, like where, I never knew this. I never knew there was a problem between Native folks and Black folks because I did not grow up with that being the enemy, right? We had a very clear enemy and that was not it. So this Sacred Waters pilgrimage had one mission um, with many objectives, but one mission, which was to begin to heal the relationships between Black and Native people and to use this process to heal our relationships with one another and our relationship to Mother Earth. Because as someone of African descent and as someone with indigenous blood from this continent, I know for sure that the traditions that I'm raised in and the traditions that other native folks are raised in, they, they actually match African, native to Turtle Island, they, they actually match. In fact, we tried this out at Bayou Rising at the Dulac Community Center in 20, I believe it was 2018, might've been the last time we did it, where we had a session where it was only black and native folks could be there. So all of our white allies were asked to step out of that space. And then there was no colonized language allowed. So it was a lot of silence and smiles and gifts and drumming and singing. Um, so just building on what I had seen to be possible, the Sacred Waters pilgrimage was really supposed to be an intentional journey to begin a process to heal the relationship that if we figured this relationship out could heal this nation. And if we figured that, that out, how to heal this nation, we could help heal the planet. And so the journey was intended to go from the headwaters down to the mouth of the Mississippi River. And the intention was to, as Black and Native women and Two-Spirit identified folk, to go back to the very basic things that we all knew to be true, which was our ritual. Our rituals, whatever they were, whatever we remembered, whatever little pieces we had, and then also the ritual of us like knowing ourselves, right? So um, we're Southerners, we, we, we know how to welcome people, we know how to greet people, we know how to go and into someone's home, um, we know how to give a gift, we know how to say thank you. You know, we, these are very basic things that you don't have to teach anybody uh, who's, who's carrying this identity. And so this was to be a journey where we made ritual down the river where we honored the water at every stop, where we moved together as Black and Native women and Two-Spirit folk, where we put some intentionality around what is happening to the planet right now, and where we, where we recalled and called forth the traditions that we had from Africa and from Turtle Island. And it was beautiful. Um, it was amazing to see an idea of about 15 people turn into about 200 people wow. on and off who were just interested in what we were doing. Um, it was painful to hear what women and two-spirit folk from the Black and the Native communities continue to experience from their own community and from the external communities. It was amazing to see the generations of knowledge um, and, and, and it didn't always come, you know, it wasn't always like the old people know. Um, 
sometimes the young people knew. Um, sometimes someone had done some research or brought a fact or brought a nugget. Um, and it was, it was really powerful to witness us all connecting around water and what that water meant for our lives, for our economies, for our families, for our health. Um, it was really great to see such beautiful connection. And all we had was an idea. This was during a pandemic, by the way. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, if there's a, you know, I come from a Christian tradition, right? So it was like, the, when you got a good idea, the devil is about to come for you. You know, like it's only on the really good, well, I mean, if, if this is gonna work, then the devil's coming at full force. We had a pandemic, we had black uprisings, we had all kinds of stuff. We had to move with security. I'm sorry, yeah, I can hear some sirens. Acknowledge sirens. Okay. Acknowledge the sirens, right. Ashte. Um, but we had to move with security. We had to, I mean, it was crazy and we still did it. It was like, despite everything, we still did it. We were, you know, at some places to get to the river, there's a, a, in a deep, deep um, incline to, to get down their elders, getting down to the water and everyone doing what they needed to do to make that ritual happen. Um, I was just telling someone the other day about this one stop in Tennessee where we just gave this one Native woman, it was just a line of people offering gifts to her. She just cried. She must have cried for like an hour. She just cried. And the gifts weren't even like diamond rings. You know, it was honey and eagle feathers and um, handcrafted uh, crafts and material. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. Who, who could even think about that? Um, we, the idea was small and then people added to it and then it became something that was greater than all of us. And I got to experience moments of deep spirituality um, and I got to watch a lot of people heal. And it was really something I, read, I didn't anticipate. You know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer and I like to get the thing done. <laughs> Period. It is a, it is both a good, good problem and a problem for me. <laughs> um, and so, of course, I knew people were going to connect. Of course, I knew we were going to complete the journey. But what I was not ready for was how, how broken we all are. How much being together could heal us, could heal, could help us heal ourselves, and we could heal each other just by being with each other. Um, how much we needed to acknowledge that water and the water in us coming forth over and over again. Um, I had no idea it was gonna be that powerful. I knew it was gonna be right, but it was also very powerful and very spiritual. We ended this journey, so we began the journey on summer solstice. We ended the journey on winter solstice and the solstice stops were the only times we could have non-female um, uh, or non-two-spirit identified folks with us, which meant we could have the fellas join. And I remember the first stop at the headwaters, there was a gentleman with a drum and he and his daughter just showed up. We didn't even know them. You know, someone had told them we were there and he just showed up and uh, it, was, it was a beautiful moment at the beginning of the river and when we made it to the end at the mouth, we were honored to have the principal chief of the Homa Nation, the former principal chief, as well as the vice principal chief, all male identified. Um, and they lit along with male and two spirit identified folks, a, a fire, a sacred fire for the end of the journey. And we got to hear about sacred fire. I remember asking uh, uh, Chief Thomas, I was like, can I ask you some questions about the fire? He said, I, I said, I don't know if I can ask or whatever. He said, well, if I can't tell you, I won't tell you. I was like, okay, great. So I just asked like 22 questions, but he was telling us how this, some of the ash was from fires long ago, like long, long ago. And so here we were standing amidst something that was, you know, 
from fire, a fire that was lit a long time ago and the, the fire was kept. It was so powerful to see not only what the feminine energy could do down the river on each full moon together with no male identified folks, but then to end with all of us together and to have a sacred fire at the mouth of that river. I mean, it was like, it was really glorious. It was really an honor. Um, and on this solstice, the next day was the appearance of the Christmas star, you know? So where they had the two planets. I mean, it was, it, I'm telling you, it was, it was off the chain. Nobody, nobody anticipated any of this. Um, the planets just aligned. <laughs> The planets just aligned. It was a beautiful, beautiful journey, a tough journey, um, a necessary journey. And I believe, you know, I think I believed at the beginning, we're going to do something great. Um, and what I know now at the end is that we are a part of um, something that has always been um, necessary and great, but ongoing. We were not the first, we won't be the last. It is an important journey. And we've, we've added our energy into that very sacred ritual of, of honoring that water. And I feel really proud of it, really quite proud. And I think we did some healing. I think black folks and native folks sat together. I think they ate together. You know, it's not hard um, when you're trying to figure things out um, to, to get things done together, uh, feed each other, you know, make sure people are okay. And we proved to ourselves that the issue and the problem of Black and Native tensions can be solved. In fact, we are more alike than we are unalike. We are, we are all today products of imperial forces, one way or another. And we can choose to break that off of us and reclaim our, our, our natural existence on this planet. And um, everywhere we went, we asked for permission to be there. Everywhere we went, we thanked the water and we thanked the, the land um, and we thanked the people of that place. And we began a system of honoring that I'm, I'm just really quite proud of. Together, we did it. We did it together. Do you feel like, um, what do you feel like the journey, you know, we, we haven't necessarily talked about this yet, but it seems like, um, you know, that journey also, you know, helped you or, or, or changed your sense of personal identity? Yeah, it did. You know, I, The, the black identity in America is, is, is complicated. It's more complicated than B-L-A-C-K, you know? It, that word makes it seem very simple, but it's not, it's very complicated. Um, and for me, a little more so than probably the average black person in the country. Um, there was a political moment where so, so Creole used to be a whole other race in, in Louisiana. It carried with it um, access and power, but it also carried with it, you know, an othering. Uh, it, it is not white, but it is not black. Um, and this community that I came from, which was Creole and Choctaw and, and uh, Shata, um, these were very distinct communities that lived in a place together. And then at a particular political moment in the US, you had to pick a race. And so instead of having and living in a complex identity, you basically had to pick one. And to not pick black, to be something other than black was to reject your blackness, which is what was happening. And you know, I've heard the stories. I've heard indigenous nations being rejected their federal recognition because the argument was that they weren't native, they were black. 
And I understand what they're saying because I'm from a place where Creole folk and native folk were completely intertwined. So I, I get what's happening, but you know, there, there's a federal, you know, definition to your nativeness. There's a political definition to your blackness. And there was a moment where you have to choose where you had to choose. And when I was growing up, I grew up in this Creole neighborhood. I grew up, you know, with a, with the name uh, of, of Pichon. They, they knew exactly who's, <laughs> they knew exactly what <laughs> house I was in, you know, like they don't even know your first name. They just know whose grandkids you are. They know exactly, they know, oh, that's one of Mary's daughters. Okay, that's, that's how that goes. Um, I don't know that they ever learned my name. I think the first time people started hearing my name, they're like, that's our name? They never even knew it. Um, wasn't relevant, wasn't relevant. They knew whose house I belonged to, whose kid I was. Um, it, there was never a need to simply be one identity when I was growing up. But when I went to college, I really, I left the South and I had to choose. And I was not about to reject blackness because I knew what that meant, right? It was to be ashamed. And I, I was, I was, I'm not ashamed. I was not ashamed of myself. And I've never actually been ashamed. My mom made sure we were not. She made sure we were very proud of our black skin, of our heritage, of who we come from. But choosing blackness, let go of Creoleness or any sort of indigenous identity. Um, and I began to learn, you know, you don't just get to claim uh, your native identity because of your bloodline. If you weren't raised in that particular heritage, it's an offense really to say my mom and them were Choctaw, you know, like <laughs> that's the general thing that plays out in the black community, my grandma and them were Choctaw um, or, or Cherokee is usually the, the word. Um, and so my identity really did, I, you know, I chose blackness, I choose it today. Um, but on that journey, I got to be both. I got to, rem all of the things I remember about the bayou and, and traditions and ritual, they come from my mother's family. They come from the Pichon side. They come from, they come from that indigenous place. They come from that bayou. Um, I have my father's name and I, and I have, a birthplace in Shreveport and a bloodline of Cato, but I did not learn any of those traditions. And so I can't claim it except I know it, you know. Um, and so in that sacred waters pilgrimage, I got to live in both and activate both all of the bloodlines of my of my body. And I could feel it. I could feel very distinct African moments. I could feel very distinct uh, Native moments and I could feel um, other things running in me too, um, to be quite honest about that. So I, I, I don't have a desire to reclaim my Native identity for the political moment, but I do feel a, um, that acknowledgement, the, the space to acknowledge both all of the sides of myself also helped me to see I have a role to play in making sure that Black and Native people actually deal with anti-Blackness and deal with um, anti-Nativeness and, and start healing some of these things that we don't like to talk about. Nobody likes to really acknowledge, but it happens when you live in this kind of nation. You know, you assimilate into whiteness one way or another. You assimilate into this colonized mind one way or another, either side, both sides. So to have some safe space to peel it off together, it feels like I don't just have an idea, I have a duty because of who I am and where my waters meet, you know? Um, the, the lines that make up the river inside of me come from several tributaries and I'm really proud most people don't know their heritage you know I come from I come from people who remember stuff I come from people who know generations they can they, they literally go back and they tell you who and who lived over there and what they used to do and what used to happen is how I understood climate change As the elders in my community start saying things like they've never seen this the whole time they've been on the planet and they've never heard it that means that's 90 more years, you know, of, of knowledge they're carrying with them. Then I know we have a problem. <laughs> that's not the same thing as the floods we deal with all the time. They're saying this is different. 
And that's how I knew this was different. It's that that knowledge and that the people I come from activated me and it is precious. And I am so honored to have that because I know so many of my relatives have no connection to their place and to their home and to their people. And, and we have the world we have now because of that disconnect. Um, so I've changed in that I, I feel my power. I haven't changed what I check on my box um, when I fill out the form, but I feel the power um, of where I come from and whose I am. And I know to honor the Choctaw Nation and the Choctaw traditions that I was taught. Um, but, I, but I know I can, I can be my whole self. Um, I can claim my blackness and have that knowledge all at the same time. And, and I hold that with, with, deep, with deep honor and responsibility. Thanks. Ashe. I'm, I'm seeing in the chat, we have a special guest question coming up. I think Jeffrey has a question he's gonna pop on with. Hi, hi Colette. Um, uh, I was very interested in what you said about, you know, what boxes you check um, and your black identity. Um, I'm not really trying to talk too much about myself, but my own birth certificate says I'm Negro, which is probably why I do ethnic studies work because I've tried to figure out why that was the case. Mm -hmm. But when you check that one box, is there a sense to you that blackness is in fact a mixed ethnicity? Maybe not this, quite the exact same way that Creole is, even though we never get a Creole box in Louisiana. Right. Um, but uh, you know, I think about say, um, you know, a lot of mixed ethnicity black people are just considered black. Right. Jimi Hendrix, Crispus Attucks. Uh, my favorite being James Brown, who's the blackest person to have ever lived, and is a quarter Apache. Um, and so, I'm just kind of wondering if you could like maybe give your thoughts about that, and then I'm going to disappear again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That is such a great question, Jeffrey, because it's really gets to a bigger problem. Um, the question of blackness is a political question because of the legal definition of whiteness. Um, blackness didn't exist until whiteness existed. Before there, before that time, there was nation, bloodline, tribe, geography, but there was not blackness. It, that, that didn't make any sense to anybody. Um, and it didn't start off like that, right? It started off with the sort of translation of, of uh, Black from other colonized languages, right? So Negro and Negro and Noir, you know, now, we, now we're getting to, the word is Negro, but the, but the origin means Black. Um, and what are they saying about Blackness? We're coming from, I forget how many nations, the transatlantic slave trade um, uh, pillaged from, but it was, I believe, over 30 or almost 30 nations. So none of these people would call themselves the same thing, but all of a sudden they just got to be Black. And Black did not have a political meaning until whiteness was established. And whiteness was established to establish power in this nation, to establish access to power, access to wealth, access to citizenship. And so the problem, and Black people talk about it all the time, is that we get put into this one box, but it is so diverse. It is so mixed. It is so um, different when you go to different areas of, of this country and, and different areas of the globe. It is a political determination by the power class. And that makes choosing Blackness and not choosing Blackness a political act, right? This is why, I mean, people got really offended when Creole folks would say they were Creole and not Black. It's, it's uh, a rejection of a sort at a time when to reject your Blackness was to um, claim your access to power. Um, claim your, your, your closer access to power. Um, but, it is, but, it is at, but it is at the very best insufficient. Um, 
and I, and I know this growing up with a Creole mother with indigenous blood and a black father with indigenous blood and none of the indigenous, none of the indigeneity or the Creole heritage played any role in the boxes that I check to go to school or to go to the doctor or anything like that. Um, it is deficient on purpose. <laughs> it's, it's deficient and devalued on purpose to give black people their full identity, to give people with dark skin their full identity is to give them power. And we're working in a system that absolutely does not want that. It wants to relegate us all uh, to one thing. In fact, I find it interesting because I think this current moment in history might might shift this a little bit. I'm watching how the um, uh, the um, census questions are. Oh, I got a siren. Um, I'm watching how the census questions are looking for white Latinos versus brown Latinos. I'm looking at how. Uh, you know, that we're doing the thing that happens in this country, right? There's a shift around how we look at race and how we redefine it and who gets put in what class and category. And the only reason you would have to ask, after spending all this time telling us who Latino is, when there is no country of Latino, there is no, okay. So after, after spending all this time doing that, to now say, are you a white Latino or a non-white Latino? The only reason to do that is to use the white numbers to maintain a sense of power. And this is what happened with Creole folks. This is what happened, you know, this, this happens in our country because this is about power and what our laws say about who has a right to access power. And so, yes, this is deficient at best and intentionally destructive at worst. And it diminishes the many dimensions of someone like me, and there are many, many like me. It diminishes us into a category, and then it puts us in our corners, and then the tension begins. Um, but I know better. You know, my community was <laughs> quite mixed, and the languages shifted. And even the Creole, you know, I, the Creole family I come from, they married other Creole families. So I don't know if you know how this works, but basically, if you were Creole in Louisiana, the, you, were, you were Catholic, you were a mixture, and you had another language. And your language was um, a colonized language, some African words, and some indigenous words, some native words. You could tell which Creole people were from by the way they spoke Creole because the Creole from my area has Choctaw words in it. The Creole from Cane River um, had, had a whole different indigenous um, influence on the language. And even the Creole people look different, right? But the, but the mixture is the same. It's just not the same percentages and not the same colonizer. But, and then there were Creoles over toward um, Lake Charles and, um, and in Brobridge. And so there are these different languages, but the languages are influenced by the indigenous people of that place. That's, you can literally trace which Creole group you come from by the indigenous uh, nuggets in your, in your language. And that is indicative of how, you know, how it all worked, how the food worked. Uh, I was, <laughs> I was, uh, some they had a native dude making fun of me one time because I was talking, I was bragging on my gumbo, and he was like, "And I bet you put tomatoes in it." And I was like, "You damn right, I put tomatoes in it." And he was like, "And that's how we know, you know." And it was like the natives and the black folks argue about tomatoes in the gumbo, and I'm like, "This is some, this is hilarious, this is beautiful <laughs> to me that you know who puts gumbo. I mean, who puts tomatoes in the gumbo? That tells you almost like who they are. You know what I'm saying? Yeah." That's like, I <laughs> That's the kind of stuff you know is real and you know is real too. Cause you know I, I always say that um, people who think okra don't, uh, if you think okra doesn't belong in, in gumbo, you probably think you're white. And if you think <laughs> tomatoes don't belong in gumbo ever, you definitely think you're white. <laughs> and I'm telling you, 
<laughs> and I'm telling you, and I'm telling you, the, the word okra, the word okra, when I went, when I lived in Africa for two years, they said, do you want some gumbo? And I said, yeah, we're speaking in French. Tu veux le gumbo? Oui, <laughs> bien sûr. <laughs> of course I want some gumbo. What they bring back is stewed okra, basically, because the word okra is, okra is, is in West Africa is gumbo. Here I am thinking gumbo was a soup and it could be made all different kinds of ways, not understanding that the word for the dish was the thing from West Africa. And so I felt like I won all of the gumbo challenges at that point, by the way, because I have met the people who think okra don't go in gumbo, doesn't go in gumbo. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? Of course, how can you have gumbo without okra? And I came back from Africa feeling very superior. Um, uh, everyone, okra means gumbo, gumbo means okra. So all gumbo must have okra in it. Um, but I also knew that how you make your gumbo was where you were from, what you thought of yourself. I always knew that if you didn't have okra in your gumbo, you were Cajun, right? Um, you were Cajun. I, I didn't. I I really do like how the native joke about the tomatoes was like. Um, it was hilarious in the moment, but if you think about what we had access to and where these where these enclaves are, you know, they we are eating of the land. We're eating of the what we produce. We're putting all of that um, into into the pot and. I understand that our gumbo and our language is what the community looked like. It's that mixture. And it could exist together and it could all actually be one of the same thing. And black or native doesn't quite do it justice for what it is, right? Um, the identity question, the labeling, it's a thing and it's part of a power construct and it's part of a structured oppression and we've all eaten into it. Um, and we've got to do our best to get it out of us as best we can, but I'm not sure we could ever get it all out of us because it's, it's pretty deep in there. Cause we have to, you know, you can have these kinds of conversations and then you got to go maneuver in the world, you know, and then and then the lines come back and you know exactly what people are referring to. And you could just say human race, which is what people do, but that's what, we, that's what you do when you, when you don't have any political consequences for not choosing a race. But for some of us who have brown skin or very recognizable features to not choose your people is a, is a detrimental rejection that you can't often come back from in your soul. And so, the question is the right question, Jeffrey. That's the right question. Thank you so much for answering that. And uh, thanks for letting me give in and, answer, and ask that question, Hayla. Word up, thank you for that. One thing that you mentioned twice, once, you know, on, that happened at the Dulac Community Center and then another time in your answer when you're talking about the value, um, you know, talking about this identity and the metaphor of gumbo, um, you also spoke about language and the importance of language. I'm wondering, you know, could you speak a little bit about what what is the importance of language to you personally and, and what languages are those and, and how do you negotiate them? Yeah, uh, I'm, I think I'm probably one of the best code switchers around, to be honest. Um, and um, I, I, I attribute that both to my, to my parents, really. Um, <clears throat> My grandparents spoke Creole before they spoke English. And my grandfather, who was more educated than my grandmother, I think he went to sixth grade. Um, when he went to school, he was punished for speaking Creole French. And he was punished so badly that he did not want any of his children speaking Creole French. And so he did not pass down that language to his children, except <laughs> they didn't stop speaking it. They spoke it all the time. And my mom and my aunts and uncles heard it. They know words, they know phrases, they know, um, they know some things. And my mother was the first girl um, in a, a family of 13 children. 
and she is a linguist. Um, she speaks, I believe she speaks five or six languages. Um, and she's very good at learning languages. And she was adamant about her children being exposed to languages. So at a very early age, we were listening to like French records. This is when they used to play records. The French records, you know, you, you'd hear like Motown and then you'd hear like some strange record from France of someone singing in French. And then you'd hear um, some new um, uh, artist from the Caribbean. Um, and, and it was just always music and sound and language and um, just a real respect for it. Um, my father, he only spoke English, but he was a communicator. So my mother's a linguist and my father was a communicator. <laughs> and <laughs> and he, he had some time being like a news anchor. My mom says it all the time. Every time she, she hears me speak, she's like, you did not get that from me. You got that from your daddy. And so it's, I know he was a person who could be understood. And, um, you know, early on, I, you know, my mom took students to France every year. Um, she, my mom, as a little kid, my mom was one of the teachers fighting to get French back in schools in Louisiana. So there's a big fight. Um, and it was like the Côte de Fil and it, we had to go to Lafayette all the time. And I remember competitions in French and my mom's one of her biggest impacts on the Louisiana school system was getting French back in schools. And that was the little kid chasing her at all of these conferences and meetings because culturally it was important. And it was the Cajuns and the Creoles getting together to preserve our language. And, um, and I just had a love for French, all, you know, all my life. Um, I could speak to my, I couldn't speak Creole, but I could speak French back to my grandparents or, um, you know, just, I, I lived in another country and, you know, French was the colonized language. I could get around almost all of Francophone Africa, you know, and, and claim my Africanness through this colonized language, you know, it was very, it's, just, it's a mind, it's a mind, it's a, it's, a, it's a moment in your mind where you hear the tribal languages in Africa and you realize you, not only do you not know that language, but it will take you a while to figure that out. But what you do know is the colonized language and the educated people can talk to you and, you know, it's a thing, it's a thing, but it allowed me access to Africa. And um, I have always loved French. I studied Arabic and learned how to read and write Arabic and understood that even Arabic for many indigenous peoples in North Africa was a colonized language, a colonizer's language. And so I just began to think about, you know, if, if we didn't have all these imperialist <laughs> oppressive moments um, forcing language on us, what, how would we communicate? And it becomes so clear that singing and drumming and, you know, I, in addition to learning French and learning these languages, I also sat in my big mama's church uh, in Shreveport where the black women would get together and they would moan. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but like, this was a thing, you know, and it was just, I mean, it would go on for like, I mean, a long time. They would, they would just moan and then they would breathe and then someone else would moan. And it was, there was no words for hours, just moaning that sounded almost like music, but it wasn't, I mean, it was, but it, it was prayer. You know, it was prayer. It was prayer without words. And um, I don't, I can't forget those things. I can't forget what it is to connect that deeply with no words. I know it's possible. And then I started thinking about like what, you know, I learned from Chief Shaka Zulu um, of the Golden Feather Hunters in New Orleans, you know, that black people were here before slavery. You know, Black people and Indigenous folks had relationships before slavery. Black people didn't just come here in slavery. <laughs> there were like thousands of years before slavery, Black people were traveling. 
how did they communicate then? This is where we get to ritual. Um, because how do you communicate with people you don't know and you've never seen before? Something you have to, you realize communication is so, it's words sometimes, but most of the time it's energy and gesture and, um, and ritual. So for me, I've come to acknowledge the power of the colonized language and the power of being able to communicate the power to tell a story, the power to hear, but I do not rank that above um, the prayers without words and the rituals full of gesture and the drumming that your people and my people can understand and we're from two different continents. Um, and when we were in Dulac, we had Homa men and African American men and African men drumming to each other. It was it was so powerful to to just why I don't I don't even know what they were doing. I don't even know what they were doing. It probably wasn't meant for me to know what they were doing, but they were communicating with those drums. They were communicating and they did not, the black people did not drum first. They understood whose land they were on. And they understood, and 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 nobody came in until the chief called everyone. He called everyone in. This was Chief August Crapel called everyone in. But like you didn't go in until you got called by the chief. And then there was people in regalia, Homa people in regalia, who were dancing around these drums. And I'm thinking to myself, we are talking to each other. You know, we are communicating with each other. We're not using colonized forms of communication we're using what we know to be true and and to be you know to hold up to hold the test of time that's what i value the most and, and you know that is that's what has survived that's what i know has survived so um at the same time i do want to mention i'm really sad to acknowledge that my community is going to be one of the communities um, lost to the sea, to sea level rise, because of where we are on Lake Pontchartrain and the erosion of land and the rise of uh, the water column um, and, and the, the sea level. And I know that my mother is one of the last people who speaks the language of my grandparents because she was the oldest girl and she was in charge of certain things. Um, and there are a few elders left, but not very many. And when I think about what we're gonna lose to sea level rise, I think we're gonna lose our place, right? You won't, you won't be able to look at a map of Louisiana and see where we were, but you won't even be able to hear us anymore. You won't be able to hear our language spoken. Um, you know, we have these trees and these things that are produced on our land because of where we are, you know, that lake was formed by the river. So there's rich soil here and there's things that will be lost. And I, I think about um, language as one of the, um, one of the things we're going to lose to this climate crisis. Um, and it, and I think about that because I've heard other people talk about it in Fiji. <laughs> you know, I remember talking to these folks in Fiji, they speak this other tribal language and that, you know, they're losing their country to sea level rise, but they're, they're, they're gonna lose their language to it because now their generations of folks are speaking English or French or some other colonized language. So they're gonna lose it too. And I just think about all the languages we're gonna lose to this climate crisis because the old places will go um, and our old people will go and so the language question for me is, is, is a really precious one, you know? Um, and so I'm trying my best to be a part of archiving things and listening to stories and paying more attention to the old people when they talk and trying to remember stuff that they say, because, you know, I know it's precious. It's not just, we're not learning it. It's, we won't be able to learn it soon. When I'm thinking about what you're saying about being precious, I, I feel like there's like, you talk a lot about the trees or like, you know, like <laughs> these old places and the mapping. And then you also talk about the water, like tradition and stuff. And uh, like, 
I'm wanting to go in that direction, but there's this barb in the back of my mind. It's just like, what's up with Ohio? <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about Ohio? Because I feel like that's important. Uh huh. <laughs> Ohio. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm going to tell you the truth, uh, which is relevant to this conversation, actually, and relevant to the question of identity. Um, well, when I was growing up in Slidell, I, I had a lot of success. I'm, I'm a very goal-oriented person. I'm, give me a challenge, I'm going for it, and I'm, I think I can do it. Pretty sure I can. And um, I was oftentimes the black token kid. Someone needs, you know, something happening in Black History Month, we'll send Colette. Um, the, you know, I remember, I just remember doing lots of little things because I was the black kid that was, you know, you know, articulate enough and in honors classes and strong enough, you know, um, but it was a it was an interesting role because it was um, also hidden, often pulled into the principal's office to help stop a race fight or um, looked to by black or white kids as you know a, a person to speak on behalf of or to to call out on behalf of you know it was it was a lot of pressure it was a lot of pressure. It was a connector role that I was, I, I was and am still very good at, but it was tiresome. And I literally told my mother that I wanted to go to school as far away from the South as possible. I applied to schools in like Washington State and my mom, my mom I mean, I'm crazy. My mom knew I was crazy. She, she's like, I've been this crazy child for all, all of her life. <laughs> so she knows me well, but she, she, and I had a top scholarship. Um, I had a Louisiana scholarship to a state school. So I was going to go to Grambling. My, my worst case scenario was I was going to go to Grambling State in North Louisiana and, you know, do my thing. But I, my mom said, you can apply to wherever you want to apply. You better get a scholarship. That's what, <laughs> that's what you better do is get a scholarship. And if you get a scholarship, um, then you can go wherever you want to go. And so I applied, I had won this, um, <laughs> they used to have these like Coca-Cola, I have a dream essay contest or uh, McDonald's something contest. And I won a few of them. And the school called Kenyon College in Ohio has the number one, one of the best English programs in the nation. And they look for writers. And so here I was, this little, kid winning a greater new orleans share the dream competition and i got a note you know they send you a little send you a little pamphlet well, you should check us out we we understand you like to write and we are a school that respects and honors writing and check out our english and so my mom called my uncle who was a professor in california and he said kenyan college you better send her there she can get in there you know she can get in that school you should send her there and so my mom said, well, they want you, you can go. And I got a scholarship and I went to Ohio expecting to be in the liberated North where there were no racial problems, where I would not be tokenized and I could just go to school and learn. I love school. I love learning. I love that stuff. I remember getting there and seeing one guy with a Confederate flag. And I was like, where are you from? <laughs> he was like, Wisconsin. I was like, oh, Jesus. Because, you know, I grew up with Confederate flags and I'm not, you know, I know people get very upset about these things. But when you grow up with that stuff, you, you almost learn how to discern who means you harm and who's just like a, a level of ignorance that doesn't really have anything to do with you. This dude was from Wisconsin with a Confederate flag. I'm like, y'all weren't in a Confederacy, you know, like at least have an argument about some heritage or something, you know. <laughs> he didn't have none of that. He meant he meant me harm. I knew it for sure. Um, and I didn't recognize the KKK presence in um, the Midwest, but it was significant. 
Um, and we were being told, you know, how to recognize um, signals and where not to go. And I'm like, are y'all kidding me? I thought I just, I thought I just left it. I thought that was the South because all the books I'm reading saying y'all are more educated, more enlightened and way more advanced, but I am not finding that to be true. <laughs> and, um, it was a tough realization, but I was at a very privileged institution and it was very um, secluded and protective. And I had a great experience at this elite institution that wanted me to be a better student and a better um, person in the world. And I got there, I was on scholarship and I, I, I declared international studies as my major. And they were like, well, you're gonna have to go abroad. And I was like, excuse me, I'm gonna have to go abroad? But you're telling me I have to go abroad? And they're like, yes. And your scholarship will pay for everything. And I'm like, well, it's, <laughs> you're telling me I get to go abroad for free? Is that what you're telling me right now? Because I'm so out of here and I'm totally going to Africa and you better tell me there's an option for Africa. They're like, you have three options for Africa. I was like, oh Jesus, I am out. Y'all are never gonna see me again. I, <laughs> my junior year. <laughs> the only reason I chose, I, 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 anyway, I went to school in Morocco my junior year and I loved it. And um, I loved that my school required that of me. And I came back and a whole bunch of my fellow students had been abroad their junior year. So I got to hear about everywhere. You know, my friends had just been everywhere. Um, and then by my senior year, I was, you know, by my freshman year, I was struggling with my grades, cabin fever, mad that the, there was too much snow and not enough sunshine. And by my senior year, I was class president, making great grades, having seen the world and applying for other things. And I appreciate that experience in Ohio because it is where I met some of my closest and dearest friends to this day. It is where I got the deepest part of my education that I think serves me to this day. Um, and it is, it is what helped me to see the world, which is absolutely critical to how I vision solutions in this global climate crisis right now. You know, if I didn't have all of that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be where I am right now. So Ohio was weird. Um, I did not see much of Ohio when I was there. I, I stayed mostly on the campus and at the college, but um, I honor Ohio every time I speak about it because it held me safely for four years, um, four formative, important, unforgettable years of my life that have made me into what I am today. And, and I, you know, I feel honored to have ended up there. It was a little, little strange and they don't have enough sunshine, but honored nonetheless. <laughs> cool. Thank you for that. <laughs> Super helpful. Like, but it is a strange, it's a strange blip. It's true. Yes. It's true. <laughs> there was a shadow of the puzzle that needed to get there. Um, I, I'm feeling a few different directions this conversation could go in next. I'm feeling like, you know, hearing more about why you chose international relations and how that kind of went to law and what you're doing now. I'm hearing more about, you know, um, who is your community and, you know, hearing more about how you were defining these houses and, um, and what that means to you and, and where are they and are, are they, you know, the erosion that I'm hearing. And I'm also mm. hearing about your mom and this tree um, and sitting under the tree and, and the concept of making decisions as a family and this, uh, yeah. yeah. Where you wanna, where you wanna go? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, those are good places to go. Um, I think the tree will get me to the people uh, part of the houses. Uh, and then what was the first one? Uh, your career in law, which I kind oh, of yeah. link into that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. Uh, let's, let's see if I can zigzag a bit. Um, so I come from uh, a Creole community that has, I believe the, uh, oh, sorry. 
uh, a Creole community that has, um, I believe it's 127 original families um, in this space. Um, I, can, I can look that number up. There's an actual number of families and those families have built out from there. Um, and that Creole community has existed where it is since um, before the United States uh, colonized that area. And so the existence in these bayous and in this um, marshy, swampy place with good crabbing, good shrimping, um, uh, good, good deer, um, wild boar, um, is, is, is a very, very, it's a very fertile, wonderful place. And there are family names that you can identify that are very old. Um, Pichon is who, who we come from, and there were several of them, and um, Trouye and Davalier and Cousin and Laurent and Torregano. And um, there are these names that are, are old. And so uh, they, they trickle out for many generations. You can, you can trace lines to these names. And so my grandfather is on Pichon land and that's where he built his home. And he built his home, a little shotgun house, I believe originally had three rooms and now has, I think six rooms. Um, he built this shotgun house for his wife and children. And my mother was born there in that house. And behind the shotgun house is a big old tree. And this tree, I don't ever remember it not being there, but at one point my grandmother was in a wheelchair. And so they ended up making a deck from the back to the tree. So that she, cause before you would walk down the two steps walk under the tree and sit under the tree, but then she couldn't walk anymore. So they became a deck. And that's how important this was, okay, to get under this tree was to build a deck so that grandma could roll out and get under the tree and everybody could. And in this house that my grandfather built, it's built up, it's built up so water can flow beneath it as, as all of them understood. Uh, we live on high ground. So um, we live right on highway, 433 now, Bayou Liberty Road. And um, it's, it's full of trees. It's full of big old pine trees. But this, the tree that's in the back, I don't even know what kind of tree it is in the back, actually. I'm gonna have to go ask. Um, but it's different from the pines. It's uh, wider, bigger shade, lower. And um, you could sit there for hours. In fact, as a kid after school, you would come and you wouldn't even go through the front door. You would just walk around to go sit. <laughs> she just go, just, the route was around the house to the back of the house under the tree. Um, people were always peeling stuff back there, shrimp, pecans, something. Somebody was always doing something back there, um, peas. Um, just always something, someone sitting under there doing something. There's always a radio on. So there's either music or news or something. And if there wasn't music or news, it's because they were like whistling. My grandfather could whistle to the birds and the birds would whistle back to him. You ever saw that? Gotta watch these, man, these old timers. Boy, I tell you, my grandfather could, the birds would talk to him. <laughs> my grandfather was like Dr. Doolittle before Dr. Doolittle. He was talking to the birds, they talking back and he could whistle so well, they would whistle back at him. It was great. Um, it was just this, oh, and then they had one of these pumps, these hand crank pumps. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. The garden was back there, these hand, old hand crank pump. Um, it was just a magical place. And it was a big old yard. We would play baseball back there because 13 children equal a whole lot of grandchildren. So there was like a full team at all times playing ball back there. And, you know, the bases were the trash pile, the back tree and the <laughs> Terrible, but wonderful. Um, so this tree was just this very important um, 
positioning in the backyard that everyone sat under, all the elders sat there while the kids were playing out. And um, then it became this place with the deck. And when it was time for me to go to, well, when I, when I wanted to go to undergrad, we went under the tree because that's where everybody was sitting all the time. But it wasn't really a question. At that time, I, I, knew, I knew I wanted to go away. And, and it was really a matter of, did I get a scholarship? Um, but the decision about college versus the military versus working, which were the options my mother gave all of us, that happened under the tree. You know, Y'all are getting older. Are y'all about to graduate? You're going to have to decide what you want to do with your life. You're not going to be a bum. <laughs> So your options are the military college or get a job and you may choose what you want, but that's what's going to happen. So the sort of um, announcement was made under the tree. But the big decision under the tree for me was going to law school. And I had come back from Africa. I was a much calmer person at this time. And I got the letter, you know, these letters, the schools I got into. So it's only four law schools in Louisiana. So you know, the other three law schools are white, very white, and two of them are private, very expensive. So the two state schools, LSU and Southern were, and it was in Baton Rouge, and I, you know, hadn't, I thought I preferred Baton Rouge to New Orleans. I know better now. Uh, but anyway, at that time, so yeah, I was just like, I guess I'll go to LSU, you know, I guess I'll go to LSU. And my mom, you know, she said, you've been in white institutions all your life. You know, you excel there. Have you thought about going to an HBCU? And my uncle was sitting there. My uncle Mac, God rest the dead, was sitting there. And, um, you know, he was just listening. And uh, I think he was really proud of me for even having to make a decision of which law school to go to. But it was... Uh, it was a family decision. And the family that was present was my mother and my uncle and the tree. And um, my mom told me, you know, she said, you know, it's a big decision. You got to pray about it. You got to make sure you're making the right choice for yourself. Um, and they both left me. <laughs> they left me under the tree. I don't even know if they planned. I'm sure they, I'm, I don't know, you know, these people, they, they know what to do. Anyway, they, I just remember them leaving me. And I just remember sitting there for a while. And I wasn't sitting there alone, like, I have been abandoned. I was sitting there like I was being held as I made a decision. And, you know, I said, I, my parents went to Southern. I feel, I feel honored to be able to go to where my parents went to school. Let me, let me make that choice. I'm not one of those people who has, I don't have problems making decisions. <laughs> I just like to, I like to get counsel, but I can make a, I can make a decision. And I went inside and I told her I was going to go to Southern. And, you know, they both, everybody hugging in the kitchen, you know, and it's good. But, but, the, but what was left was I had to sit under that tree to make my decision. And it was like, I don't want to say it was like words. It wasn't words coming to me, but it was a lot of energy coming to me under that space as I made a life decision in a place that was the most nurturing, protected space that my grandfather had built. You know what I mean? Like I, you don't get in a more safe space than like a, a, a handed down line of like place. So yeah, I made that decision and I felt like it was right all in my heart and my body. Um, and my family was proud of me. And, and that tree has seen many decisions that seen that tree has seen, you know, it's where everybody goes after the funerals. You sit under the tree. That's where people go you know, the day after the wedding and you're tired, it's, you know, the picnic and stuff was under the tree. Like it's, it's, um, it's where we gather. It's where we, and it's on my, my papa's land, you know, so um, yeah, just sacred land, sacred, sacred space. Um, a lot of trees went down after Katrina, you know, we lost in St. Tammany Parish, something like two thirds of our tree cover. A lot of pines went down, a lot of pines. And these big, big old trees, going down. Um, but um, the main tree in the center did not. It still stands. And I think it has seen a lot of water and a lot of floods. But um, yeah, it's 
a central place on the land, <laughs> on the actual land itself. It's probably, it's probably smack in the center, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and it just reminds me that I'm supposed to be there. You know, I'm my grandfather's child. When people ask me where I live, that's the address. You know, I, I may live in many different places, but that's where I'm from. That's where I live. That's where I belong. That's where I'm safe. That's where I'm powerful. That's where I'm sure and clear. Um, and it makes it, you know, a, 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 an even sadder thing to realize that it's going to, you know, that we will lose it to, to the sea which is the only other force I think I have respect for is water, <laughs> you know, if it ain't, if I'm not talking about trees, I'm talking about water and here, um, this land will be taken um, by the water in, in the near future. Um, but the decision to go to law school was something I made when I was eight years old. And after Katrina, my mom, you know, we digging through all of our stuff and my mom found one of these family reunion books that they used to make. And it's a question, you know, my name is Coco in my family. Like, you know, uh, Coco, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's typed out on the typewriter. And I say, a lawyer. <laughs> and it says, Coco, age eight. <laughs> it's like, wow. wow. Telling you, I don't have problems making it. The decisions are not difficult for me. <laughs> and, uh, but she found that thing. It was, it was you know, uh, one of the things that didn't get flooded with Katrina of, you know, these things become precious, right? Because you, you lost so many photos and so many albums and stuff, but um, that did not get lost. And then me making this decision to go to law school, um, it was all just a full circle for me. Um, and it was what I intended to do since I was a little kid. And so it was the vision that I had for myself from when I was little was to be a lawyer and the decision to go to law school under that tree was my final step on my life's journey that I had planned out. And then I went into being a lawyer and I went to, you know, I thought I was gonna study international human rights and work on um, uh, human rights abuses from dictators and work on ecological problems in Africa. And here I am in the aftermath of Katrina understanding ecological problems and a true um, challenge to our democracy and all of the things that I had studied in these other places were now relevant to South Louisiana, to the United States, to my backyard. So I thought I was becoming a lawyer to go help other people. And I did for a while help other people. Um, but now I understand that I'm a lawyer because I am to be um, an instrument of use for my people. And, you know, the communicator that was my father, the linguist that was, that is my mother, the, the place that I come from and the authentic standing that I have as both a black and a native person who has a right to fight for the place I'm fighting for. You don't get any clearer <laughs> than these things. The law degree is sort of the kicker, you know, like um, I know your law and I know mine. Um, and the interesting point to the law degree is to really look at not the international relations piece, but the world religion piece, which was my minor, because I have understood and had the ability to study moral law and to understand laws that are not written and then to study laws that are written and to understand the rules there. So I feel like I get to play in a very particular role and um, I get to move with a particular kind of um, facility and ease because of who I am and what my background is and then what I've chosen as a craft. So, uh, and then some of the skills my parents handed down just cause I was a kid who liked to talk too much and always liked to argue too much and you know, um, had a strong sense of herself. So it's, it's coming to fruition now. And I, I asked my mom the other day, I was, cause I'm still not sure she knows what I do. Um, and, and she told me she was proud of me, you know, you, you have your mom will tell you they're proud of you. Like it's, you just keep going now. So I just assume that she's okay with me being the opinionated loudmouth. uh, 
advocate for climate justice that I am because, you know, all of those pieces come from, come from that place, come from Bayou Liberty, come from Bayou Vincent, come from Bayou Bonfukai, like it comes from somewhere that she's very clear of and, you know, I'm, I just feel, I feel really lucky. I know people don't have that. I know a lot of people don't have that. I know a lot of people don't know where they're from and whose they are, but I'm very clear. And I, and I think that's a gift. It's a really big gift, yeah. It's a really big gift. Ashe. I, um, I know I, I saw in the, in the chat just now, I think Jeffrey has left us. Um, oh, I think he had a he had a bit of car trouble. He needs to. I, I, I haven't quite oh, left. Oh, <laughs> um, I kept trying to leave, and then every time I would get up to leave, you'd say something interesting. I was like, "Well, I need to get up there." <laughs> uh, so, but I, I do have to go, um, and uh, I have some time time sensitive car stuff that I have to do before four thirty. Um, so, uh, so if I don't get to see you at the very end, I just really appreciate the, the stuff you said. And it's just definitely, I think per sentence, it might be the most quotable <laughs> interview that we've done so far. <laughs> so I, 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 I certainly enjoyed it. And um, I look forward to listening to the rest of it um, when we put it together. And then of course, I'll be contacting you as well. Thank you so much, Colette. Uh, Thank Haley, you, Jeffrey. Haley and Ida, I'll see y'all soon. See y'all later. See you later. Peace. Um, yeah, and so I, I, I'm also knowing that um, that Ida, we we need to bounce. She's a hard schedule deadline, and I know that okay. they have some questions that they want to ask. So okay, there's a lot. I I feel like I could talk to you or listen to you for another five hours. Oh, <laughs> you're making me feel good about myself. Thank you. I have so many. It's just like a, a list of notes that it's just like I. There's so many things I want to I want to get to that we're not going to, but. Which is sad, but I just need to acknowledge. Anytime, that. anytime, anytime. <laughs> but, uh, we'll find another time. Please. Yes. Um, there's one one thing that we try to do with all interviews, which is kind of like the, we call it the indigenous AMA section that I think is really important that we do for each interview. Um, this is kind of talking through, you know, um, part of this interview is just making things public or, you know, putting a public interview out there for people who may want to listen, but may not have the chance to physically interact with you or may want to interact with other people later. Um, and so thinking about like a wide public audience who would be listening to this, um, I'm thinking about you know, two questions that we always try to ask is, you know, um, is there questions or things about your indigeneity that people ask you that you're uncomfortable talking about? And then the other question to that is, um, are there things about your indigeneity that you feel like you really wish people would ask you about or you would really like to talk more about or be able to have a space to, to share more about? Mm -hmm. Um. I understand indigeneity broadly. Um, the indigenous blood of Turtle Island that I carry and the indigenous blood of Africa that I carry. And it's interesting because I am received in, on both continents very similarly, um, which is people recognizing me immediately as related to them. Um, this happened with a, an Atakapa Ishak elder. You know, I went to ask a question one time and she was just like, well, what tribe are you from? And I was like, no, I never, you know, I, I know that that is a thing, but it takes, it, it's really like a, a lot of indigenous folks will ask me uh, what tribe I'm coming from or whose peoples, uh, you know, I'm affiliated with and there's always a look or a stare or a wondering. And, uh, and that is, those moments are, I forget, I forget that they're gonna happen and then they happen and, and I, I, I think I secretly like them actually. Cause it's all, it's like being seen by your people even though, um, you know, black people do this to each other all the time too. Especially like the passe blanc who don't want you to know that they black but you be like, you know, <laughs> it's like a little eye contact like I see you. Um, 
But the same thing happened in Africa. I remember thinking like there, there are these tribes, you know, and, 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 you know, over and over again, I was told I look like a blank or a blank. And um, so I knew, you know, the truth of that as well. I think what I don't like is when the question implies, the question around my indigeneity um, seeks to devalue or dishonor my blackness or seeks to um, honor or dishonor um, my native blood from, from the Americas. And I don't really know how to deal with that because um, I'm all of them, you know, I'm all of it all at one time. It's not a, it's not a thing, but, it, but the, the conversation around political identity, it's a, it's a real one and I understand the confusion and I even understand people wanting to claim you, you know, I want to claim folks all the time. Um, I know that, I know that feeling. Um, but what I love when I get asked about is, um, or what I would love to be asked about more is uh, what I was taught. Um, what are some of the traditions of the Choctaw Nation that I know from my grandfather and from my grandmother? Um, what are some of the techniques that are unique to that nation um, and the area we live on the North shore of Lake Pontchartrain? Um, what are some of the words? What are some of the, you know, and that the, the, the language piece and the words, it's like, you know, you have to like sit with your cousins and remember stuff. And you have to be like, what did Papa used to say? What did he used to call you? And what was that word? And, you know, just, the discovery or the rediscovery or the the re um, the remembering of these things that were shared with us. We were just little, you know, we were just unaware of the political reality that we were going to be adults into. But I, I'd like I'd like to engage in that more because we were given little gifts and we might need help unpackaging them. And but it gives me excitement. Um, to sit with other folks and be like, oh, I know that word. I know what you're saying. Like, I know, I know that song. I know that plant. Um, I know that story. Uh, that's always exciting for me to just sit with other people and remember stuff together. Um, and the truth is, the other stuff, I mean, I, it doesn't bother me. I just sometimes get sad about how we have to label each other and ourselves and how we have to bifurcate our identities and lose certain things and lift up other things. But it doesn't frustrate me. It just reminds me of the moment we're in, the time we're in. Yeah, but I look forward to the sharing and remembering. Um, yeah. Um, Ida, I'm wondering, I know that we have a hard stop at uh, in 20 minutes, so I want to make sure you have a chance to ask any questions if you if you have any while you were listening. I actually don't off the top of my head. Uh, I feel like I got to a lot. I've just been like immersed in listening and thinking and Yakoki, thank you so much for everything. I'm so glad <laughs> to have you here speaking. So Me blessed. Too. Such an opportunity. Thank you so much for reaching out, Ida. I really appreciate you thinking of me, honestly. Okay, because I got questions. If you oh, okay. <laughs> I thought we were like, and all right, okay. No, no. <laughs> Respect. I just want to make sure that they have time in case, but I would not. Okay, I have another one. <laughs> I guess the last one is about, you know, we talked a little bit about the tree, and then uh, I, I think if you could spend some more time talking a little bit about the water, um, mm. you know, some of the things that you mentioned were, you know, you use the metaphor of multiple waters and kind of like spaces. You've also used the metaphor of water as, you know, something that's rising and coming up. And um, I feel like there's also like this, this feeling of your mom and, and rituals that you were given and the ritual of water and the, the omnipresence of it and the, and the indomitable force, but also the nurturing life. I was wondering if you could talk about water and tradition a bit. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so 
I witnessed ritual in the bayou many times when I was young. And certain songs or words that were said, I didn't hear them again until I was uh, a teenager, maybe even in my 20s. And they were African words, an African ritual. And they were associated with the ocean mother who I will call Yemaya. Some people call her Jemonja. Some there are other words, um, but it has to do with the spirit that dwells with um, I would say definitely ocean, um, but also the fertility, the fertileness of, of a bayou, of a swamp. And so I started recognizing like song, like like rhythms or songs, and I'm like, wait a minute, that's you know, I I know this, I know something about this, um, and then I just started um, looking more into these things, and um, you know, it's really what I wanted to know most about with Africa. You know, if, as an African American, you, at least I. Um, I, w I wondered where we were from. Like, that's just not a piece of information. I mean, we know the French side, you know, we know the native side, but we don't know the black side. We just know we're from somewhere on the continent, which is a very large continent. <laughs> Most people keep forgetting how big Africa is. It's huge. Um, and so to, to find that I heard a word that is from this area and comes from a tradition and it, it relates to water and we are water, people, we are living in, you know, hurricane flood, bayou, lake area. Um, water wasn't ever anything to um, fear, but it was something to always respect because of the floods that always came. Um, I just, I just, and, and apparently, <laughs> when I was a little kid. I love swimming. I don't know why. My mom hates it. I love it. I could live in it. I think I might be a water animal. I'm not kidding. I believe I belong in the ocean. Um, but I like love it. I could stay there all day. And, um, you know, I'm just, it feels like all the signs are pointing me to, um, you know, having a particular relationship with water. Also, I'm a triple Pisces which when I tell people who know anything about what that means and I don't know what it means exactly, I just watch their face and they just all do like the slow head shake, like, mm, 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 you are a hundred percent water. I'm like, I am. Uh, so, so me and water, we got a thing. Um, it is, it is the spirit I claim. It is the, um, elekes that I wear. It is the, um, the honor, um, that I know to give. And it's the connection that I have very naturally. Um, so I, I feel it, I feel it like um, water ritual sometimes just comes to me. I don't even know what I'm doing sometimes. I just know to do it. In fact, actually moving with some spiritual leaders and really sort of hearing like you know, we should always do this and you should try to make sure to do that it was really helpful so that I, you know, did what I felt, but also didn't make any sort of dishonorable or, or disrespectful mistakes uh, while I was trying to remember things or, or feel things like, you know, when you have a vessel, um, it needs to be natural. Don't ever use a plastic bowl or something made from toxins or, but you could use a shell. You could use a, a turtle uh, shell, you could, and, and these are things I knew, you know, I had, but anyway, just having them affirmed and having water ritual affirmed was really powerful for me. Um, and it's something I do all the time. <sighs> but it is tension to love the thing that will be the 
instrument of destruction for my community. It's a real, it's a real tension, you know, to, to not fear the water that flooded my community through a tidal surge, to not be angry at this sea that is coming and is gonna take my land. Um, and to understand that water doesn't work like that. And neither, according to African traditions, and I believe some indigenous traditions, neither, neither does nature. Nature is not a, you are good, let me give you a breeze. You know, <laughs> you are bad, let me give you a fire. That is not nature, it just is, right? The water just is. Um, she is not reacting to the goodness or the badness that I, that I have put into the world or she is, she is just herself um, existing. Um, but, but water is reacting to what we do in this climate crisis. Um, water is what's being impacted uh, by the root causes of climate change. All of this extraction, all of this taking, all of this consumption, all of this oppression. We see the impacts through water because she is the most fluid, you know. Um, and she's serving for me as a warning, a nourisher, a sense of history and a contemplation of future all at the same time. And that is just really powerful for me, all of the things, the tension and the, and the love, you know, the, the, the past and the future and the role of water and where we come from and what this planet is made of and how it will all happen. Um, so I, I just try to sit still with her whenever I can. Wherever I go, I try to see her. Um, I try to go to an ocean at least, at least once a year to honor her. I try to, I'm in Boston right now and you know, I, I, I wanna see what she looks like and smells like up here. I wanna, you know, I've, I, everywhere I go, I go to honor her and put a little gift um, to let her know that I appreciate, you know, the life that is water. It's, if, if, you, if you had to describe me, I, like, I really love people. I really, I, I really love people and life means a lot to me and I'm gonna fight for people to live which necessarily means I fight for water. So that is my, <laughs> that is my water, <laughs> whatever. Uh, what, um, real quick, but what is your, what are your hopes? What are your hopes for the future? Mm. What gives you hope? Mm. What gives me hope? I think, you know, I, I get a lot of hope when I see how free the generations below me are. <clears throat> when I see younger people dealing with things that I didn't think the society would ever get to. Um, <laughs> I, I, I I, I love little kids. They, they make me happy. I don't have any kids, but other people's kids, you know, the kind you can have fun with and then give back. Those are the best, those are the best kind of kids. <laughs> but, um, but every now and again, you need some little kids around you to just kind of bring you back to, um, to, to life and what it is. And I, and I have a lot of hope and the joy that I, that I get to see, um, the pure, the pure joy and the, um, and when little kids can acknowledge they've had enough, you know, it gives me faith that there's some part of humanity that can acknowledge we've had enough and we can stop taking things, you know, that gives me hope that, it, that we could still get there. Um, and I have a lot of hope in, in um, this, this, some of the music uh, that I get to hear these days coming out of Africa, especially, gives me gives me a lot of hope. Like it's um, 
don't know if you've heard of like Afro pop, but <laughs> Afro pop gives me hope because it's still very African and, and somehow it has made it through um, all of the things and, and is now emerging, um, you know, as relevant as some of these other musical genres um, that Black folks have contributed to. And I just, it just, the resilience of Africa um, and any time that that can be manifested gives me hope. And but the one thing I do to get through every day is I, I take a walk through the cemetery. I look at the trees. I try to get my heart rate up. Um, I get in my truck, I go get a coffee and I drive through the swamp and I get out of my car at this one place and I look for an alligator. And sometimes I get to see, I usually get to see one. Sometimes I get to see a lot. Um, and I'm reminded that I come from a place where alligators still live and they are older than dinosaurs. And there's something about that. And I do this almost every day before I start my day. I just remind myself that um, I come from a people who survive. And that gives me a lot of hope. Well, I think that's that's a that's a thank you so much. And that's a, that's a wrap. I'm wondering, is there anything that you feel like you want to talk about that we haven't covered yet? Um. I thought this was great. Thank you. I just thank y'all for even, um, I don't know, opening your understanding of who, who should be included in this conversation. I think it's, that's a brilliant, a brilliant approach. And thank y'all for this opportunity. I didn't know I needed it so much. Sorry, Ida, it took me so long to schedule, but I'm glad I did. I'm <laughs> glad we did. <laughs> I needed it too. You know, I hope this is... Uh, helpful to the project, but also just thank you. It was very helpful for my soul. I appreciate it. And I think we covered everything that the universe needed us to cover today. Good. Good.